Um, welcome everybody to uh, Talent Insights, um, brought to you by HireWell and CareerWell. Uh, I'll be hosting today's segment, which means these three will do most of the talking, hopefully. Um, <laughs> so we'll be talking about, uh, uh, we titled it Acing the Interview, Prep Tips for Tech, Marketing, and HR. And I'm actually joined by three of my colleagues who focus in each of those specific areas. So, um, which we thought was important because a lot of things are changing right now. Um, in terms of how companies are hiring, but also how they're running interviews and how people should prepare. So uh, I'd like to welcome Ryan Brown, Matt Tokars, and Don Effler. Good morning. Hi, guys. Hey. So everyone, why don't you guys uh, introduce yourselves quickly, give everyone kind of a, an understanding of your background. Uh, Ryan, why don't you start? Sure. Hey, everyone. <laughs> I'm Ryan Brown. My face is probably familiar. James and I partner a lot on creating content for Firewall and CareerWell. Um, but I am an HR recruiter. I focus specifically in placing HR individuals. Um, and I've been with Firewall, gosh, I guess two and a half years, going on three in December. Awesome. awesome. Uh, yeah, my name is Matt Tokars. Um, I focus on the digital marketing and experience space. Um, I've been working also with Hirewell for about the same amount of time as Ryan um, and have a background both in digital technology and digital marketing roles. So kind of supporting both sides of the business, but we've definitely seen um, a lot of growth on the marketing side and that's been my area for the last couple of years. And I'm Don Effler. I've been with Hirewell uh, two years in August, uh, so coming up close. But I've been doing technology recruitment for the last eight years. Uh, and that's all different kinds of technology from you know, software developers to project managers to infrastructure. So, you know, I'm here to kind of give that, you know, broad technology interview advice. Cool. Awesome, guys. So um, let's just kind of jump right into it. Um, I wanted to... Um, I remember when COVID kind of first started and all everybody could talk about was um, how to work from home. And then it was how to manage a team from home and then all these kind of different at home concepts. Um, but I think um, this has actually taken a little while to kind of sort out because companies have um, changed how they go about interviewing and therefore changed how they go about process, change how job seekers should go about um, actually preparing. Um, what have you guys seen? Like in terms of the process and the clients you've worked with and how things are being run differently, um, I guess if you could each kind of give a quick overview of like what's what are those small changes being and how people should maybe start to repair. Sure. So on the HR front, um, one of the big things I'm noticing is the initial phone screen is kind of out now. Instead of doing that 30 minute touch base over the phone, um, a lot of people are going straight to like the video screen, which in this case, you could kind of consider your in-person interview. So they're taking that initial step in terms of like the phone screen off the table and wanting to like build rapport kind of face to face um, instead of doing that phone screen. And then I think um, in addition to that, obviously, it's kind of twofold, but in, in one sense, we're seeing the interview process speed up kind of because instead of having to schedule like multiple people for the same day and trying to find a time where everybody's in the office, you can schedule people, you know, throughout the week whenever they're available. Um, but I've also noticed additional steps because you're not getting that like face to face in person um, experience, we're adding sometimes an additional like video screen or follow up or panel interview over video screen in that sense. So um, in a lot of ways, it's interesting because the the process is taking some time shorter because we're able to do more steps in you know a shorter amount of time. But at the same time, there might be like an additional step added that maybe you wouldn't have if we had the ability to meet in person. Yeah, I'd agree with that, especially on the marketing side too. Um, you know, the the initial phone screen. Uh, may or may not have, just kind of kind of fine, but um, I've seen an added emphasis, especially towards the middle and later stages of the process on these the, like more panel type discussions. Um, and a lot of that is just to ensure that, you know, candidates can communicate and collaborate in today's world, especially now with a lot of stuff being done via Zoom or, or via Microsoft Teams or, or what have you. So there's a lot more of an emphasis on that communication collaboration piece than, than maybe initially had been discussed before because you could just meet in person. Um, you know, and, and I think as candidates and organizations alike are more um, aligned and, and more comfortable on Zoom or, or on Slack or you know, the, the different, um, different offerings, um, the easier the flow will be, but they need to make sure that they have that extra step involved to, to make sure that people have that comfort level, that they could be in front of a screen and still, you know, own a room or, or work with leadership on you know, a variety of different, you know, topics. Yeah. I mean, I would agree with 
both what Ryan and Matt just said, it's, you know, definitely changing. I think, you know, one thing, interesting thing I've seen too is, you know, given the, you know, given that there isn't a need for people to be physically in an on-site interview, it has created, as Ryan mentioned, kind of a faster process, especially because, you know, sometimes you can split up, like if you don't physically need to go in, you can kind of split up maybe that onsite interview into a few different steps, right? We, this happened with a client this week. Someone was going to be on PTO Monday through Friday. So we're interviewing with that person on Monday and then the rest of the team on Wednesday, right? And, you know, you don't really need to have five hours blocked off and everyone's calendars is 100% kind of working with it, which allows for the clients to interview quicker. Um, and especially with technology, what we've seen is, you know, I'm not sure if this applies to, you know, HR digital marketing, but, you know, especially in development interviews, the large part of the onsite interview process is a process known as whiteboarding, where you, you know, architect and get in front of a, you know, a whiteboard or a blackboard and map out different kind of architectures and different kind of codes. And, you know, there's this very involved process, which obviously doesn't communicate as well to video interviews. So the types of technical assessments that people have been doing have been, you know, trying to supplement that in a variety of ways. And you know, we can go into more about what those ways are later, but like the shape of the interview and technology is also changing to a certain extent. Yeah, I, I've also seen a bit of an uptick too with organizations using like a Myers Briggs or personality or leadership type tests too, just as an added layer to really understand the person that they're bringing in. Um, some of that stuff can be flushed out a little bit easier in person and you know via screen. It's sometimes hard to to kind of articulate some of that. So I have seen organizations moving and shifting a little bit to some of the, like the personality and leadership type assessments just to just to get a feel for for people. And while those assessments can you know, are not always 100% accurate. You never know what people are saying just to say. Um, it does add another layer of depth on onto a profile, you know, as you're bringing them through the process. Let's talk about, uh, let's talk about research um, and trying to understand what you need to know about a company because some of the other things that have been happening um, also affects maybe what you want to know about a company if you're a candidate. Um, so what, in terms of like, how are you recommending people research companies now? And it may or may not be different than before, but I'm just kind of curious um, what you guys have seen or what people are doing differently now. Sure, I can start, you know, with technology specifically too. And, you know, I think it's always obviously important to research the company and, you know, obviously, you know, the basics, right? Hopefully you have a LinkedIn profile, the people that you'll be interviewing with, that's a great place to start. The website is obvious and really exploring that into, you know, beyond just what the product is or what the business is of that organization, you know, maybe who their competitors are and, you know, what kind of space that they fit into. And I think that's pretty general advice for, for anyone interviewing for any kind of job. Uh, the advice with technology is something that I always give, which hasn't changed is, you know, that job description that you're given, um, you know, hopefully, uh, you know, usually has quite a bit of technologies listed on it, right? You know, more so than just kind of your Word, Excel, and PowerPoint, right? You know, uh, a job description for a technology position may have 20 different terms and tools and different kinds of technologies on it. So I always recommend the individual to research, um, you know, each one's, each piece of technology that's listed on the job description to give them a sense of the overall technology environment of that organization. Whether they know it or not, they should at very least do a Google, especially if it's a tool they've never seen before, know what it does and know what in their tool set that can compare to so they can speak to it. So researching the technology environment of an organization for a tech role is extremely important, maybe even more important than the actual business of that organization. Yeah, piggybacking a little bit off of uh, Don on the tech piece, um, I had worked a lot with digital technology roles. And one thing that I thought was especially helpful for people as they were going in to meet with teams was, was using a website called Built With. Um, it basically shows what, um, what websites, um, what technology companies are using for their website. So it could be anything from, you know, their CRM to their, their content management system to, you know, different pieces of technology that the organization's using. Um, that gives you 
uh, you know, a heads up on what they're working with now. And if the job description is saying something different, allows you to kind of show them that you've helped transition in the past or, you know, kind of walk through some of those as well. So it's, it's been especially helpful, especially as some of these, these digital marketing and digital technology roles kind of blend together sometimes to ensure that you know kind of what you're walking into in the environment that's currently set up. Um, when I think about researching a company, especially early on in an interview process, you want to know enough to be dangerous, but nobody's expecting you to come into the interview process and be a total expert. This is also your time to kind of peel back the layers from people that are there internally to learn a little bit more about the company and what they're doing. But one piece that I always recommend is reading recent news articles. Um, doing some research to see if there's been any changes in leadership recently, or maybe it's a startup and they recently won a new round of funding. What does that mean in terms of like the people side from an HR standpoint? Does it mean they're going to be growing and adding additional headcount? If there have has been changes in leadership, how did that affect the culture? Those are some of the things that you want to start to, to research and understand so that you can frame questions and get a better understanding during the interview process of the company and kind of the internal temperature and what's going on. Yeah. And, you know, from a marketing perspective, a lot of marketing's obviously external research, whether that's to other businesses or, or to consumers, um, take a look at companies' marketing efforts. You know, if, if it's, if you're joining a B2C company, you want to see what they've got out there that, you know, you're being marketed to um, and just understand where, you know, some quick wins could be had or some low hanging fruit might be to, to improve what they've got out there. Um, you know, it, it's, it's certainly helpful to just understand where, where they're, where they're reaching out to people and, and their different efforts. And, you know, if you're coming in with different experience or, or wins in particular areas, then you can kind of frame the discussion around what you've seen um, and help them, you know, ensure that you, you know, done your research and know what's going on. Um, Don, you brought, I want to make sure we didn't miss anything else too. Uh, Don, you mentioned job descriptions. Um, Matt and Ryan, did you guys have any other thoughts on that? Like, is there anything like when your um, candidates, things they should be gleaning off of job descriptions in terms of interview prep? Yeah, absolutely. I think when you're reading a job description, you have to pay attention to, to what's most important. And there's easy ways to do that. And I think most specifically, if there are certain areas in, in HR, right, like you can be a generalist and kind of focus on a broad range of things, or it could be a more specific kind of specialized skill set within human resources. But there should be a way for you to uncover from the job description what's going to be most important or kind of the biggest areas of responsibilities. And as you're reading through that, those are going to be the areas that you want to be the most prepped on in terms of having having experiences from, you know, your current and previous roles or being able to share some, you know, wins that you've had in the past that could relate to that. So I think that's always a great way to kind of start things. But then also, like, is this going to be a more strategic role or is it going to be more tactical? And how do you frame your experience around those areas, too? Yeah, and I think, you know, the biggest thing going into to any interview or, or, or working with, with organizations is to really understand the business impact this role is going to provide, um, especially within marketing. And a lot of times job descriptions will kind of highlight that at a high level. Um, so always being aware of, you know, what this role is either going to do or what this problem or what, they're, what the problem is that this role is going to solve and having a couple examples of, you know, areas where you might have had to solve a similar problem or had an impact on the business that, you know, in your previous roles that is especially relatable. Um, it, it, one, helps you not, you know, stutter over things and try to, you know, draw from experience on the fly, but then two, you know, also shows that you understand what they're looking to solve with this hire, um, both short term and long term. Yeah, and I think it's important to note too that not all job descriptions are created the same. Uh, some are very, you know, descriptive into what the role is and why the role is available and what the mission is. And some is just like a list of basic, you know, requirements. So if you do have one of those, you know, abbreviated job descriptions, it's a great place to really identify questions that you should and need to ask in the interview if it's not already you know, pronounced on there. Yeah, absolutely. Well, let's get a little bit into the interview stuff. You really hit the meat of it here. Um, Cause this is something we, we hear a lot. And it's a pretty common question. Um, how do you answer a question about something you're lacking or don't have direct experience with? So if, if pretty much everyone's interviewing for a job, part of that job is probably something you haven't done before and they're going to get asked about it. Um, what do you guys recommend for in terms of a kind of fielding and answering those types of questions as someone who's doing an interview? Yeah, I always, sorry, Matt, do you want to go? No, go ahead. <laughs> okay. Um, I always recommend like pulling from a similar experience. It might not be, you know, on paper, the exact same correlation, but for example, maybe you haven't managed a team before, but you have led prod 
projects where, you know, people are rolling up into you, or maybe you've mentored like interns and those are folks that you're kind of overseeing when they're with the company. I think having something that's similar, but maybe not the same and being to find some correlations between the two is a really strong way to say, hey, maybe I haven't had this exact experience, but here's a really strong area that, you know, could relate to this and, and kind of use those things as, um, as stepping stones to to say, yeah, I don't have this necessarily on paper, but I have had a really similar experience in the past. Yeah, I mean, I was I was going to say something pretty similar, but you know, at the same time, just make sure that you're being direct. Like, you know, there's there's nothing more frustrating from a hiring team's perspective than, you know, getting an answer to a question that ends up not being true, or that you know the person doesn't really have the experience that they tried to articulate. Like. You know, at the end of the day, you want to be transparent with them. If it's not a skill that you have right now, but you've got relevant experience in other areas that can, you know, kind of shine on as an example to that, like that's, that's really how you want to go about it. And, you know, if, if, if you were also brought into a role, you know, role A and you grew into it with role B, like show some of the evolution and the fact that you were able to, to pick up new skills and, and bring more into the table. I think that in and of itself helps people understand, you know, your aptitude to grow and evolve within an organization as well. Yeah, and to piggyback off what Matt's saying, like, don't lie, right? Like, if you don't have the skill set or you don't have the experience, you have to be transparent about that. And transparency is really, really important. So, um, you know, if you can pull from a similar experience, do. If you can't, then be honest about that. They'll find out. Yeah, yeah, you're going to paint, exactly. You're going to paint yourself into a corner that when they ask the second and third question about that experience that you said you had and you clearly don't know, like, you know, lying is a more important red flag to an organization than not having one skill. So, you know, you've done much worse by, you know, lying about it. Right. And, you know, I also think that, especially if you're going into a role and you know that one skill is important that you don't have, like as Ryan and Matt mentioned, look to your old experiences. Is there anything that's really similar, but if there's not like, what do you do? Right. So I always think, the best thing to do in that situation is hopefully you've identified that skill that you don't have and then research it right and then in the interview when they ask you know what about unit testing for example right as a technology you know kind of practice i've never used it ever professionally but this is what i've looked at online this is the research i've done prior to this interview and list all the things that you've done even in the last like day or two to really invest time in that and that's you know, the kind of, you know, go get in this that a lot of companies want to see. Well, yeah, they have zero experience with that now, but they're already doing research for the interview. I have no, you know, no issues that they'll ramp back up kind of eventually. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about uh, remote interview etiquette. Um, what have you guys seen here in terms of, uh, um, you know, I think as recruiters, we've done we've probably covered interview etiquette like a million times with people over the years, you know, covering the basics, but a lot of those basics that we, that really just don't apply right now. So what are you telling people in terms of like, you know, the, the no brainer stuff that they should know about remote and video based interviews that you just don't want anyone to, to get tripped up on? So it's one of the things I want to say before we even go into like this at a deeper level, it's just because this is a video interview, not in person does not mean it's any less formal than, an in-person interview, or it doesn't mean that it's any, you know, less casual. So you have to know, like going into it, what type of interview this is going to be. You always, always, always have to be around of your background, you know, make sure that you're in a space that like, you're not going to be interrupted. There's not going to be a ton of noise, that sort of thing, like setting yourself up for success and just in terms of location and like background noise is key. Um, also, you want to dress the same that you would if you were going for an in-person interview. So understanding the dress code, what that means, if it's, you know, an environment, maybe it's financial services that you're interviewing for, you should still wear, you know, a suit. Or if it's like a marketing company and things are a little more um, relaxed in terms of dress code, business casual, but like you can't show up to your video interview in a sweatshirt with your bar in the background. So... <laughs> yeah, it's funny. I, um, my, my wife was interviewing for a role recently and my entire setup for my, my work from home setup was moved and I was very confused as to why, but apparently, you know, I having a bar in my background and a children's play set wasn't exactly <laughs> what we consider professional. So, um, you know, good on her that she was able to, to, to move things around and, and make it work, but it, it, it's important. I mean, you know, people are certainly understanding that we're, you know, in a unique setting right now and that there's, you know, 
there's concessions that have to be made from that perspective. But, you know, the most important thing is to, is to be as professional as you possibly can be, whether that's, you know, sending, sending the wife and kids on a walk or, you know, just moving your bar around so that um, it's not showing up in the background or at least moving some of the bottles that helps too. Yeah. Not just take some of them out. You yeah. don't need all of them in there. <laughs> yeah. I know my girlfriend and dog have been whisked away into the other corners of the house, even for this webinar. So, um, <laughs> but I think another thing to note is that, you know, keep in mind too, that when you get onto the interview and you, you know, are speaking to someone at that organization, they might feel overly casual just because of the nature of kind of, you know, this remote work, but you know, keep in mind that your interview might be, you know, a small portion of their day and they have the rest of their day to kind of focus on. So even though they're maybe wearing a sweatshirt and their bars in the background, like you shouldn't, you know, reflect, you shouldn't mirror match exactly. Right. And reflect that and you do want to be more professional, even if the people on the other end, may seem more casual. One thing that, that I've been telling people to do too is um, if you're not really familiar with Zoom or you haven't done a lot of video interviewing per se, like hop on one and, and like do a mock interview with a friend or a family member and record it and then see how you come off. Um, you know, I've, I've worked with candidates where the first interview was just so rough because they, they're not used to looking at themselves while they're looking at somebody else and they don't know where to look. They don't know what to do with their hands. Like there's so many different parts of it that um, you know, you don't necessarily think about until you're in the moment. So, you know, having something, doing a video recording, you know, it's just helpful to kind of see your, your interactions and how you articulate things. And, um, it's, it's certainly been helpful. And usually two or three interviews in, it's a lot more back and forth and, and easy, but, you know, you have to also keep in mind as a candidate that a lot of interviewers haven't done this themselves. So they might be awkward. There might be gaps in, in, in communication might be those awkward moments where nobody knows what to say or what to like, how to, how to discuss what's, what's happening. But, you know, preparation is key and making sure that you, you know, kind of understand how you are in these moments. Yeah. I throw in two quick technical components. So one, um, if possible, use a USB mic. Audio is key. Um, most people's computer audio by default kind of sucks. Um, just throwing that out there from the live events we've done. So um, this one costs like 50 bucks, but even if not that, if you've got like um, ear pods or iPods or something that has a microphone integrated in it, it's always gonna sound better than your actual computer audio usually. Um, the other thing too, if possible, you also need to make sure you're wired in with an ethernet connection versus Wi-Fi. So many times I'm on calls with people um, or just whatever when their Wi-Fi is bad or spotty and there's it hiccups or cuts out or whatnot. And if you just buy, you know, if you need to buy a really long ethernet cord, they're not expensive. Just make sure you're actually wired in for your interviews to make sure you don't have an internet hiccup. Definitely recommend doing that. I'm following neither of those, those last two I, I, currently. I can, and I can tell. <laughs> Mike, James, can you tell my mic is here? here it is. Yes. Okay, good. I, I know Ryan has one. Yeah. Hey, it's my any? first webinar, yeah. guys. You know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, cool. So let's get, so in terms of what you should be asking companies right now too, like what, there are some other things going on. You know what I mean? There's other things happening. I'm curious what you are recommending candidates ask or interviewers more specifically, good questions to ask C-level executives, the CTOs, the CHROs, the CMOs right now. One of the biggest questions I think people should be asking folks within HR at the C-level. So CHROs, how did your company handle COVID? How did you treat your employees? What was the way you went about supporting folks during this time? Understanding and kind of peeling back the layers from a people perspective, how the company reacted, I think is going to be extremely important. So anybody that's at the C-level or currently interviewing folks, be prepared for that question because people want to ask it and they want to know the answer. I think understanding culturally, like how important were the people in your organization in terms of retaining them as best you could? How were you able to communicate? Um, you know, if you weren't able to retain folks and had to go through rounds of layoffs, how much notice did you give people? How, you know, 
how, how did you go about having those conversations and making sure from a people perspective that you were taking care of your employees as best you could, even if you weren't able to keep them? Did you offer resources to help them, um, you know, find new positions or connect them with the vendors that you partner with in terms of staffing to get them on somebody else's radar? So understanding that that's going to be a question that everyone is going to ask you, I think it's important. And if you're interviewing, you want to know the answers to those things to kind of, you know, understand from an HR perspective, what am I walking into? If a company didn't handle things the right way during COVID, you, there's going to be some pushback in terms of, um, you know, winning back the, the respect and um, the trust of employees. So you might have, you know, a hard time kind of rolling things out or, you know, being viewed as a business partner in HR if things weren't handled accordingly during COVID. And then also one of the questions I think everyone should be asking um, C-level executives in HR is, does HR have a seat at the table? meaning are they a part of business decisions or are you kind of a back a backroom function where you're just making sure people have benefits and are being paid accordingly um, and those are things that you want to understand to know if this is a company that you want to work with yeah absolutely I mean you know I, I think it's really important to attack an interview like a stakeholder meeting you know that's that's what I what I really talk with people about like you know, you want to make sure you understand the objectives of the role. You want to understand the the career aspirations within the organization with, with something like this and, and really focus on how you can solve some of those business objectives that, you know, are, are out there. So, you know, when talking to a CMO, for example, or a VP of marketing, like you really want to understand what this role is, you know, doing today and where they expect this to be, you know, 12 months from now too. And, and getting some of the... Um, the understanding around the pain points, you know, what, uh, you know, what are some quick wins versus what are some longer term strategies or, or, or goals that this person's going to be in charge of, I think is, is especially helpful. And, you know, kind of piggybacking off of the, off of the, um, the point that Ryan made around the COVID stuff, like you want to make sure that you're, you're being a part of an organization that um, you understand from both a cultural and, and safety perspective. And, you know, that's key for a lot of organizations. So, you know, understanding how they've pivoted, understanding where, you know, where they're placing the emphasis and if they're going to want people back at, you know, five days a week right away, or if they're going to be, you know, comfortable with this kind of remote setup for a little bit. Um, it's just important to kind of understand that environment that you're, you know, looking to jump into. Yeah. yeah. And kind of with the environment, especially in technology, I think what the biggest thing that we've seen is um, kind of a difference in future state versus current state. So, you know, a lot of technology projects and kind of, you know, new implementations or new tools or, you know, new kind of future ideas have been put on pause for the moment. Um, and the focus is, you know, the, the key revenue sources now and, you know, the core applications and the core t technologies that can't be lost currently. But that doesn't mean the fun stuff and the greenfield development won't be coming back around soon. So, you know, what I would ask, you know, hiring managers is, you know, what are the, you know, what's going to be the state of the project work three months from now, six months from now, and 12 months from now, you know, depending on how COVID shakes out. But understand that, you know, just because, maybe some of that new fun stuff isn't being done currently. That doesn't mean they won't do it once the world goes back to, you know, semi-normal. And you just need to ask around what the plans are when that happens. Let's, uh, let's jump to maybe the meat of this whole thing. Cause I, I know when we kind of talk about promoting this event, we're going to get some specifics in each kind of practice area. So um, I'm just curious for each of you, um, what sorts of questions are you seeing people asking candidates right now? Um, what are the hottest topics? Maybe what's a little bit different, but what are the things that you think, you know, currently need to be highlighted? And if you're, you know, searching for a job in marketing or HR and tech, what do people really need to know? And you um, self-manage. Yeah. Like almost everybody's remote. So, you know, in that case, whether you're in the office a couple days a week or not at all, can you self-manage and how are you going to show examples of that work? So um, I think that's going to be something that's really important for folks to highlight. Um, if you 
are an entry level candidate as well, like pull from experiences that you've had maybe in internships or leading large projects, maybe, you know, your thesis project, your senior year or something like that. You're going to have to prove that like you're going to be somebody that can be successful being remote. So um, that's one of the biggest questions we're seeing HR folks being asked. Um, and I think that's probably true for just about any type of position at this point where, you know, you're not, not an essential worker, you know, having to be on site somewhere. Yeah, uh, I'd agree with that. But, you know, within marketing as well, and I know this is one of James's favorite comments is, you know, everybody's looking for somebody that has, you know, clear, you know, data to back up the, um, the business outcomes that they're, that they're looking for. So one thing I, I, I always tell people is to have like actual answers and data to back up what they've done. Um, organizations are looking, you know, to put data, um, data points of their experience and, you know, especially marketing, there's a big emphasis on data driven storytelling and, you know, it's one of those minutes and 37 seconds. <laughs> I was going to say, what's the timestamp for it? We almost made it. <laughs> It's one of the, it's, I mean, it's a buzzword certainly right now, but it's also important to be able to back up, you know, your experience with facts. And as marketing and sales organizations are partnering even closer together right now, like you want to make sure that you have an understanding of, you know, your business impact, your revenue goals and, and different things that um, can really articulate and hammer home that you know what you're talking about. Um, and it, it's, it's especially important right now as, as these organizations are, um, putting an added emphasis on those numbers. For everyone at home, we took a bet on how long it would take for someone to say data-driven storytelling and who was going to say it. So that was the, uh, I, I set the over under at 10 minutes. So we're way over on that one. Yeah. <laughs> I'm impressed to be honest. It's long to say it. <laughs> I had to find the right lane. Right. Sure. Um, as far as tech goes though, similar to what uh, both Ryan and Matt said, you know, success working in a remote environment. Like, have you done it before? And have you done it before COVID? And what was the, the story like there? has been a major question. Um, and not so much a particular question, but kind of an expectation that a lot of clients are asking is, as I mentioned before, that whiteboarding portion is kind of out of the interview process. So it's hard to get the technical, you know, assessment done over Zoom. So a lot of companies are expecting, you know, kind of all candidates to do like take home technical assessments and projects, which can be annoying because that feels a little bit like homework right? It's sometimes they take two to three hours and you have a few days to do them, but obviously life gets in the way and you push it back and you push it back. So, you know, know that the expectations, um, you know, with a lot of tech companies are, are these take home technical assignments and the expectation is that you can get it done fairly quickly, right? Some people that take a week and a half to get it done, like, unfortunately they, they've kind of moved on with the rest of the candidates that got it done within a day or two. So, just know that that's an expectation and know that you should do it quickly and take it seriously. Yeah. And, and I think that's, it's not just specific to, to technology. I mean, sure. if you're looking at, at copywriting or content roles, like people are going to want to know how you write, whether that's long form, whether that's a, you know, short form and tweets and social and, and things like that. So, you know, understand that the expectation might be to share either prior examples of your work or, you know, working on kind of a short project just because they're not going to be able to to necessarily go as deep or um, as technical as they might in an interview in person. Cool. Um, obviously wrapping up any kind of interview discussion follow-up, like what are you guys recommending now? I'm not sure if this has really changed much, but I figure since we're here kind of talking about this stuff, like what, what's, what are the trends right now? Like what do interviewers like to see out of candidates afterwards and what's effective and makes you more memorable? Anyone? <laughs> uh, I feel like I've been I mean, talking I, first the whole time. So, yeah, just uh, to so I, else a I feel like it's the same thing, um, you know, to a certain extent, right? It's a thank you note goes a long way. Um, it doesn't have to be the more personal you can make it, the better, right? But you know, it shouldn't be any more than two or three, four sentences, maybe. Um, you don't have to write a paragraph, or you don't say like this is the best job I've ever interviewed for, but just that simple act of kind of, you know, thank you is great enough. And you know, obviously give them a few days to, you know, realize that they may need to, you know, talk amongst themselves, but it's perfectly fine to, you know, ping your recruiter or directly to kind of your contact within the organization, um, you know, a few days after the interview to see if there was any update. 
As the interview is wrapping up, I always suggest asking, hey, what are the next steps for this? That way, while you have that person live, you can kind of understand what comes next and what the timeline may look like. Um, and like John said, you always want to follow up with, um, with a thank you note, in my opinion. I think it goes a really long way. You want to add a bit of a personal touch to it, too, like John mentioned. And something that you learned during the interview process as well that maybe you didn't know before about the role or the company that you found really exciting or interesting, the more personalized you make it and the less generic definitely the farther it'll it'll go in terms of um, being something that the the person that interviewed you um, enjoys and and I think that um, in addition to that following up after it's been like a week or something maybe you haven't heard anything taking the extra step and in initiative because right now a ton of people are on the job market so you want to make sure that you're staying top of mind and relevant um, it's going to be more important now than it probably has been in the past yeah, I mean, pretty was, pr pretty much covered it. I mean, that was that, perfect. just because the world's changed doesn't mean that, that some of the, the, the same follow-up after interviews hasn't, uh, or has changed too. I mean, it's, you want to make sure that you follow up, you want to touch base. If there's specific questions that you know you didn't get enough time to address, sometimes it's helpful to, to add on a little bit to that. But like Don said, you don't want to send along a novel, like not everybody's going to want to read it. So, uh, you know, be clear, concise, and thank them and make it personal, you know. Anything else you guys want to mention? Anything you had on mind, uh, top of mind today, but we didn't get get to touch on? I think just being prepared, like we've mentioned in terms of, um, you know, knowing the platform that you're going to be using is really important practicing with that. I think there's a little bit of an extra like stuff that has to go into your interview process right now to make sure that you're coming across um, the way you want to over video screen because you don't have the opportunity to do it in person. So whatever that means in terms of you getting comfortable with these different platforms, you have to take that extra step and do it in order to stand out. Yeah, I mean, the prep is always the most important, right? You know, anyone that takes the 45 minutes to an hour to prep the night before an interview is going to do significantly better. And if you're not doing that, you're just doing yourself a disservice. Yeah. No, 100%. And, you know, I think it's also important when you're talking with somebody to really understand, um, you know, if this is a replacement role, like the pitfalls and, and, and where that person maybe wasn't successful, um, as well as if it's a new role, like where in particular the, the pain points are for the organization. Um, you know, and I, I know I alluded to it before, but it's, it's just really important and to, to hyper focus on those to make sure that you've got the answers for some of those problems or can, you know, kind of share your experience around that. Um, and sometimes you'll, you'll ask those questions in the first round and have answers the second round. Like that's important too, to, to be able to kind of frame those discussions the right way and make sure that, um, as the interviews continue to, to move along that you're, you know, one answering the questions that they might have and, and two expanding upon that with relevant experience. The final thing I want to mention is as much as honesty and transparency are key, also don't sell yourself short. Just because you might not have, you know, relevant experience on paper doesn't mean you haven't done something similar to it. So this is your opportunity to really highlight your successes. You're not going to be boasting or bragging. Like you have to, you have to articulate the things that you've done well and the areas that, that you've succeeded in in order to really stand out. So make sure that as much as you, you know, you, you want to be honest and truthful in your interview process that you're also being honest and truthful about the areas you're really passionate about that you're very successful in, and that you have a ton of relevant experience in too. All right we actually had two questions that came in through the Q&A thing. Um, first one from our friend Aswa. Um, what if you are asked to meet in person and you're unsure of the safety guidelines? That's a good question. I think that in these circumstances a lot of companies are going to be flexible if you're not comfortable, but also you need to ask, hey, you know, we're in a COVID environment right now. Like, what is this going to look like if I decide to come and meet you in person? Like, is there going to be safety guidelines in place? Will you take my temperature? Is your temperature going to be taken? Like, we're not going to do the formal handshake. Like, these are questions you're 100% allowed to ask and you absolutely should. Yeah, I mean, uh, 100%, like, you know, organizations are expecting um, questions like this. And, and if you aren't expecting questions like this, start expecting questions like this, because they're going to come, um, you know, because the, the comfort level is, is important. And, and as a candidate, like, make sure that you're comfortable. If you're, if you're entering in an interview, and they're asking you to come in, and there's not answers to these questions, you know, share that that's not something that you're super comfortable with, because, you know, at the end of the day, that's, you know, more important than anything else. And you want to make sure that um, you're articulating that to them as well. 
Uh, we had another question come in too, but so two more still. Um, Stella asks, I know it's important to offer facts and numbers to back up your expertise, but what if you don't have numbers? Is it okay to say, for example, you increased revenue or improved customer satisfaction? I'd say yes. I mean, obviously, if you don't have the specific facts handy, um, you want to make sure that you're articulating that you've, you know, done those things. Um, I would expect um, an interviewer to, to then follow up and ask more direct questions on that. So just be prepared to speak about it. Uh, if you don't have a specific percentage number, like it's okay to guesstimate a little bit as long as you're not over exaggerating and all of a sudden it's it's a crazy number. Um, but it's important to to be able to kind of share some of those wins. And if you don't have specific numbers, obviously that's always better. Um, but be able to kind of, you know, be able to discuss it. And, and if you don't have reasons or if you don't have the numbers specifically, be prepared to an answer why you might not have those because that might come up as well. Yeah, I think a lot of our clients um, that we work with, you know, want to know those answers. Um, and if it's not something that your company is currently measuring, you should consider doing so for a variety of reasons. But um, if you're a candidate in whatever company you've worked for in the past, that just hasn't been something that they focused on in terms of measurements, make sure moving forward that you're keeping track of that for yourself, right? Like doing some sort of data reporting and, and understanding kind of the areas that you're succeeding in or no, you're reducing, you know, time to hire by X amount. Keep track of those on your own, even if it's not something your company does. That way, moving forward, you're going to have the data to be able to share. Yeah. Um, yeah, and not only keep track of it, but like you can kind of find metrics sometimes, right? Maybe if it's not something your company tracks, but, you know, like time to hire, for instance, if that's a metric that you're keeping, you can kind of figure it out. But, you know, to kind of answer the question, if you don't have them, I realize this isn't a great answer, you should try to find them. Um, you know, that data is important. Um, it, it, like Matt said, if you don't have it, explain why you don't have it, but, you know, keep that in mind, you know, forever that you should probably, you know, accumulate that data somewhere and somehow. I think it's to Don's point there. I think it's more of an easier thing. It's hard to do last minute, but it's easy to do on an ongoing basis. So it's one of those concepts of like, two years from now, when you're looking for a job, if there's stuff you should be tracking, start doing it now. That way on interview prep day, it's, it's a lot easier. Anyway, um, looks like last question for now. And I'm, I apologize, everyone. I'm reading the questions on Zoom. Um, I don't have LinkedIn Live or Facebook open just because if I was also pumping in two live streams as I'm putting one out, my computer would definitely melt down. Um, so <laughs> I guess for future webinars, I'll make that clear that you know, we'll be answering questions from Zoom. Um, Kara asked, not necessarily related to the interviews, but is a cover letter still relevant and needed? We might have a difference of opinion on these, so I'll let you guys go first. <laughs> it, so, so for me, and, and, and I love sharing probably too much information with, with my hiring managers and my teams, um, I always like to have some sort of cover letter or summary or profile. Sometimes that'll be tweaked beforehand, and, and sometimes it's, it's not necessarily as relevant or... Um, you know, to a hiring manager, but I always like to share specific examples and how it relates to the job description itself. Um, I don't, if you're, if you've got one blanket cover letter for every job you're applying to, that's probably not relevant. But if you're creating some sort of, um, you know, overview or quick summary, nothing crazy, you know, a couple paragraphs tops um, that highlights your skills in, in particular to this job description or, or this team or this company, like I do find that still particularly relevant. Um, usually I, I, I'll tweak it or work with candidates on that to make sure that we're articulating the right message. Um, but if you just have a generic, like, you know, this is who I am background kind of cover letter, like I don't, I don't really see value in those anymore personally. Yeah. I have three thoughts on this. One, if you're an entry level candidate, you should be writing a cover letter because you don't have a ton of real world experience yet to pull on. So you wanna share some of the intangible examples that you have that maybe aren't gonna come across in terms of your work history, right? So that's one thing. Another thing is if you're switching industries and you know you don't necessarily have the industry experience, you need to write a cover letter. And then if you're switching roles completely, so maybe you're an HR person and you wanna move into marketing and you've done a little bit of marketing stuff and some of your HR roles, you need to write a cover letter to further explain that. So I think those are the main areas where you really need to keep in mind, like why it's important to, you know, explain a little bit further than maybe your LinkedIn or your resume does. Um, but other than that, if you have the skill set, the experience that somebody's looking for, I don't know that you always have to write a cover letter for those instances. 
Yeah, I also think it's important on the application process that you're in, right? If you are just applying to roles that look good on LinkedIn or Indeed or some of these sites, probably best to just get your resume out there without a cover letter. So it's because it could be seen quickly and you want to get to the meat of your examples. Um, if you are like making a more, you know, maybe a formal introduction, you're sending it directly to an individual that works at the company or you're getting introduced through someone, then yes, a cover letter explaining kind of how you've got into this step and why you're interested in this company could be efficient, but don't just have, as Matt said, don't just have that basic cover letter where you just kind of control find the company and replace it for every job you apply to. That's just getting in your way. And that goes for resumes too. Like there should not be just a blanket resume either. So cover letters, resumes, you always have to be making sure that it's specific to the company and the role that you're applying to. Yeah, I agree. The, the thing I was going to highlight is like the overwhelming majority of cover letters never get read. So like on the aggregate cover letters, you can make the case or a waste of time. But in all the cases that you guys laid out, anytime you're switching careers, switching company, switching industries, entry level, or if it's something you're just super passionate about and there's for some reason beyond like you're a skill match, like they're doing something that you're personally invested in. Those are the things you should have cover letters for. And as these guys said, um, if there should never be the cover letters should either be something that's completely customized, but if it's, but there's no reason in using, if you're, if it's just a boilerplate situation, it's, then it's a waste of time. So, all right, I think that's it. So, um, thanks guys for, for joining. Um, and thanks everyone for watching. Uh, we're going to have some more, uh, some more webinars, some more podcasts and events and stuff from, uh, from higher well and career well in our talent insight series. Um, if I think I put everyone's, um, uh, LinkedIn profiles um, in the descriptions for Facebook Live and uh, all the stuff I've done on LinkedIn. So feel free to connect with us, ask us any questions. We're easy to reach. So, but happy to, uh, to kind of continue the conversation further. Um, till then, guys, have a uh, great Tuesday. Thanks, James. Take care. Bye, Bye. everyone.